Hi there. This is John Treidman speaking to you from PV Rhythm 10, and the topic of this lecture is ablation in the Fontan patient. I'd like to start uh, this lecture about uh, macro reentrant tachycardias with the description of IART and macro reentry in general, as well as the substrate that it exists on. Uh, here we see a Holter tracing, which shows sinus node dysfunction spontaneous initiation of atrial tachycardia, an IART or intraatrial reentrant tachycardia with two to one conduction, then one to one conduction, both with and without left bundle branch aberration. Here we have an example of feline macro reentry, which is extremely similar to atrial macro reentry. The organized pursuit around a fixed circuit uh, of an excitable animal. And that is the target that we have uh, for these types of procedures. We understand the substrate in Fontans of the atrial myocardium to be exceptionally diseased. Uh, on the left, we have an old picture showing the types of macroscopic obstacles that might be seen here in the endocardium of an explanted right atrium, including an atrial septal defect patch indicated here, an atriotomy with sutures uh, embedded in it, uh, and the crystal terminalis. We also know from histologic studies that the atrium is thickened and fibrotic. And we've understood for quite a long period of time now uh, that these areas of fibrosis, both macroscopic uh, and histological, uh, on these diseased right atriums can serve as the basis for what we might term incisional or scar-based reentrant tachycardias. This was first described explicitly by Hiroshi Nakagawa more than 20 years ago, and recently further elaborated uh, in Dr. Natasha de Groot's laboratory um, in uh, Erasmus in, in Rotterdam. We also know, though, that atrial macro reentry in most people, and more simply, is oftentimes based on anatomical features common to all hearts, specifically the tricuspid annulus, which serves as a central obstacle for macro reentry. And even in congenital heart disease, where the anatomical organization and the functional position of that isthmus may be located, uh, it is a common feature in almost every heart including those with tricuspid atresia. We'll get back to this a little bit later, but when we think about the anatomical distribution of atrial reentrant tachycardias in Fontan patients, we know that a fair number may be related to scars and incisions, but some will also be related to isthmus. And in addition, we'll see some focal uh, tachycardias, uh, usually with a micro reentrant pattern, as well as pericaval periosteal, and uh, occasionally a left atrial or septal tachycardia. In order to successfully approach these in an interventional way with the goal of um, uh, getting rid of them, uh, uh, or at least reducing their prevalence in patients with these complex anatomies, uh, we need to think in terms of basic steps uh, of doing the procedure. We need to understand the rhythm substrate, we need to make sure that our catheters have access to the myocardium, and we need to make sure that we have ability to modify tissue. Uh, in order to understand the rhythm substrate, we need to uh, put together some general principles, which we've already started doing in this talk, and also understand the patient-specific anatomy, both by what we can learn uh, from the patient's history and what we can learn by advanced imaging. As far as modification of tissue is concerned, we have to recognize that the tissue is thickened and fibrotic, and we may need to use advanced ablation techniques to uh, successfully intervene. And we need to also think about how we might assess the efficacy of our interventions after we've performed them. So uh, to sum up then the criteria that I think of uh, for a successful arrhythmia ablation procedure in general, and certainly in patients with Fontans, is that we want to map the anatomy, understand the myocardial properties and the activation sequence of the arrhythmia and how they relate to one another. We want to create safe and effective ablation lesions and demonstrate their efficacy. And hopefully we will be able to follow up and determine 
the clinical outcome of the patient. When we first started doing this back in the 1990s, uh, this is what we had to work with. We basically used fluoroscopy. We used small arrays uh, of um, catheters, generally based in the line and very much smaller. And when we did do um, a successful ablation, we could simply make a guess as to where we had perhaps ablated, as we do in the diagram on the right, and try and extract from that some sort of information about what it might mean with respect to the mechanism of the tachycardia we had ablated. This is an example of doing a trans baffle puncture uh, and ablation in the uh, um, pulmonary venous side of the atrium, probably at the cavo tricuspid isthmus, although really who knows. You can see we were pretty much reduced to drawing marks on the screen to give us an idea of where the boundaries of our uh, atria were. Uh, and yet, we were still occasionally able to perform effective and sometimes uh, um, longstanding effective procedures in these patients. To some extent at the time uh, we were um, shooting at these uh, arrhythmias in the dark, as it were, uh, it was quite challenging. The procedures were quite prolonged and frankly, we're uh, uh, lucky that we didn't have as many uh, complications as we might have in this type of uh, situation. Our process was changed very substantially by the advent of electroanatomical mapping in the late 1990s when it first became available to us. Suddenly we were able to organize in three-dimensional space uh, not only the general anatomy of the chambers that we were working with, but we could annotate them with action potential sequences such as here, which demonstrates sinus rhythm in a right atrium. Uh, we were able to use it to navigate our catheters and to reproducibly go back to points of interest. And with that in mind, uh, we were soon able to apply this to patients who had um, very enlarged right atrium. Here you see a patient with an atrial pulmonary connection and a fontan. And on the left, you see an example of their sinus rhythm. We were able to indicate dots where we recorded uh, lines of scarring. Uh, during atrial tachycardia, we could make both still and dynamic pictures, which showed us the uh, area of protected conduction, which needed to be ablated. And on the right, you can see that after we had ablated this patient, we were able to demonstrate quite convincingly that we had changed the fundamental action, action potential sequence in the heart, indicating a complete line of block uh, where we had ablated. Even back 20 years ago, we were able to rather quickly extend this to rather complex anatomy. Here's a patient with a Fontan uh, in severe Epstein's anomaly with a large uh, right atrial chamber on the pulmonary venous side of his um, baffle. Uh, and one can see from the arrhythmia that we mapped and ultimately ablated here uh, that we were able to identify uh, the uh, location of scarring related to atriotomy and how that specifically enabled this circuit with a rather unusual location critical to conduction uh, near the upper aspect of the junction between the systemic and pulmonary venous right atrium. So the first thing we used to do, and we still do when we take care of these patients, is we use the prior knowledge that's available to us from the patient's own history. We think about their anatomy. Uh, we think about uh, uh, where the atriotomy was performed and how it was performed, whether an atriectomy was performed, any patches or baffles that were inserted in the atrium that may affect conduction sequence or may possibly affect our ability to get to the atrium, and whether the surgeon had created maze lesions either uh, with cryoablation or some other technology. Once we get into the heart, uh, we try to identify large scar barriers to conduction. And this is a cartoon which illustrates myocardium with an area of linear scarring on it, perhaps an atriotomy. Uh, and placing a bipolar catheter across that scar, we can identify how the identification of two uh, closely spaced and discrete electrograms helps us to annotate an area as being part of an area of confluence scar. We can also use uh, data uh, generated in part by Natasha's group uh, in the Netherlands 
uh, about um, the electrical correlates to fibrosis in the atrium uh, and use it by setting voltage thresholds to allow us to say this part of the atrium is densely scarred, this part of the atrium is relatively healthy. So what do I mean by that? Uh, I'll show you one challenge that we use this approach to uh, um, uh, to map the substrate of a patient before we uh, induced in ablated tachycardia. This was a 23-year-old with a double in the left ventricle. Uh, he had an atrial pulmonary fontan with patch closure of the ASD. He was known to have a right uh, atrioventricular valve, which was also patched. He had subsequent resection of the bulboventricular foramen and after seven years was having recurring flutter. On the right, we see segmented MRIs of his um, atrial pulmonary fontan in purple uh, and the rest of his heart in red next door to it. And we're going to use uh, that volume imaging to correlate with the maps that we draw using electroanatomic mapping. Uh, here's a map that we made of the patient's uh, Fontan right atrium. Uh, and we've indicated with gray balls and gray areas, any parts of the atrium uh, where we measured electrical activation uh, at less than 100 microvolts, which we defined in this case as a threshold for indicative of relatively dense scarring. Uh, and you can see uh, that these areas are confluent. This is a uh, right lateral view in the upper right and an AP view in the uh, lower left. And then we also went and looked at this and we tried to identify areas of dual potentials and we marked them with small sky blue balls here. Uh, and I went ahead and drew a blue line indicating where we postulated an atriotomy scar was present. So with this information in hand, we were able to superimpose on our uh, MR-derived right atrium the locations of scarring, the location of the uh, right AV valve patch, and the location of the atriotomy scar indicated again by the light blue balls. So that when we did actually induce tachycardia, which in this case, uh, the first tachycardia was periannular, we could relate it to known obstructions to conduction and we could design our line which resulted in termination of this tachycardia. When we were subsequently able to reinduce a second slower tachycardia, we were able to map it again with reference to our known obstacles and obstructions and extend our line from the atriotomy site to the posterior area of scarring, rendering this particular patient non-inducible. Another interesting feature of this specific case uh, was the fact that when we were first starting to try to um, ablate this patient after we thought we understood the mechanism, uh, we were very much unable to get the desired effect that we wanted uh, as far as creating a durable and thick lesion uh, in the heart, which was able to stop the tachycardia. And when we looked with intracardiac echo, we realized uh, that although we were recording signals of low amplitude where we thought we wanted to ablate, when we actually looked at the catheter, it was a good centimeter away from the endocardial surface. And by putting a sheath in to allow us to go further out, we were able to visibly touch the surface of the endocardium, achieve a much better electrogram and rapidly create effective ablation lesions. I'm gonna take you through a second case now uh, in which we were needing to ablate an unusual cavotricuspidismus in a Fontan. This was a 47 year old gentleman who had heterotaxy dextrocardia in a complete AV canal. He was status post an intraatrial caval pulmonary, caval to caval baffle, which I'll show you in a moment by uh, Angio. And he was having recurrent intraatrial reentrant tachycardia requiring for three or four uh, direct current cardioversions over four months time. This was his unusual intracardiac baffle extending from his hepatic venous and inferior vena cable confluence up through the center of his atrium uh, in 
until it inserted into his proximal pulmonary arteries. And when we looked with intracardiac echo in him, we were able to identify uh, an existing, a pre-existing um, uh, baffle fenestration. And we were able to put a catheter across that. You can see us on the right opacifying with contrast his pulmonary venous atrium. And if you look on the echo again, you'll see uh, at the left of the screen, about halfway down the area of the cavotricuspid isthmus. Here you can see the right AV valve, the cavotricuspid isthmus, the baffle and the catheter. And there you see the actual moment of successful ablation when the, when the catheter is placed uh, after having done several lesions closer to the tricuspid annulus uh, at the cavotricuspid isthmus right at the base of the baffle insertion. I used to show uh, uh, pictures that uh, very much um, focused in on the uh, a summary of all the different series uh, that had shown effectiveness of ablation in complex congenital heart disease, including Fontans. And I like this more recent uh, paper by Clays et al. looking at simple, moderately complex and very complex congenital heart disease. Uh, you can see that the uh, freedom from recurrence is about 50% at two years. Uh, they identify on the right here, CTI and non-CTI dependent uh, mechanisms in complex congenital heart disease. They're about equivalent with focal accounting for about one in eight. My own colleague and our former fellow, uh, Rafa Correa, uh, put together a series looking at the uh, occurrence uh, of successful ablation and its effect on uh, the severity of arrhythmia as by our standard scoring system, demonstrating uh, the utility uh, of this procedure as far as addressing symptomatic complaints of patients with this problem. And finally, uh, Dr. Egby has relatively recently published a comparison of uh, the efficacy of surgical and ablative uh, therapy in Fontans with atrial tachycardia compared to antiarrhythmic drugs. I'll focus your attention on the lower left graph showing uh, Fontan conversion, very slightly more effective perhaps than catheter ablation. Uh, not much given the numbers that are involved and both of them clearly superior uh, to um, antiarrhythmic drug therapy. Um, moving forward in the, in the last five years, we have uh, a few innovations which have continued to advance our ability to understand uh, the arrhythmia substrate and mechanism. This is an example of multipoint mapping uh, using um, the CARDO system and what they call their pentaray catheter. Uh, both um, Biosense Webster and Abbott now uh, are developing more advanced catheters uh, for arrhythmia mapping. They each allow extremely rapid and dense uh, 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 mapping uh, of the atrial myocardium here. You can see on the left, posterior wall of a patient with Fontan uh, pathway, uh, an area, an isthmus of slow conduction ablated. Uh, and then on the right, you can see uh, an example of the effect of that ablation in sinus rhythm afterwards with block at that corridor. These techniques are also useful for getting uh, rather refined mappings of uh, voltage, uh, allowing us to understand better the distribution of fibrosis in these um, atria and perhaps identifying in anticipation of ablation potential sites uh, for slow conduction. And they can also be used to provide forms of dynamic mapping, which bring us very close to the raw data here, a form of dynamic mapping, which is referred to in the CARDO system as ripple mapping, uh, where we can actually see the magnitude of the electrograms and their timing in real time, which can allow us to really see where uh, activation sometimes trickles through uh, uh, a relatively narrow channel that needs to be ablated for success. I would say the other thing which has become exceedingly useful uh, in ablation in complex Fontan patients, especially those requiring ablation on the pulmonary venous side of their baffle, 
uh, is intracardiac echocardiography. Here you see in real time uh, the um, uh, pulmonary venous and systemic venous sides of the baffle and the right AV valve. This can be used to construct uh, real time 3D anatomical mappings and used to guide ablation here in the cavotricuspid isthmus across a Fontan baffle. It begs the question as to how you get there. Uh, increasingly, our surgical colleagues are using uh, extracardiac Fontan baffles in order to complete Fontans in those patients in whom they choose to do it. Uh, and these can create uh, real problems for electro cardiolog electrophysiologists who need to treat these patients down the line. Uh, we know that freedom from atrial tachycardia after Fontan uh, drops off substantially after 10 or 15 years. And unfortunately, uh, the data from uh, patients with lateral tunnels and total cable pulmonary connections suggests that um, they're not all that much better over time than modified atrial pulmonary connections. It is possible uh, to perform um, um, access to the pulmonary venous atrium, but it needs to be done creatively uh, and with more broad uh, uh, understanding of the specific anatomy that needs to be traversed. Here's another example of an intraatrial uh, conduit. And you can see at the bottom of this uh, baffle, there's an area of atrial tissue, which has been effectively pulled up by the baffle. And you can see here that we've gone across the baffle, essentially underneath uh, the prosthetic material and through the atrial myocardium in order to get to the pulmonary venous cavotricuspidismus to ablate in this patient. Occasionally, uh, we have had to use radiofrequency uh, needles in order to get across. Sometimes balloon dilation is necessary. Back in the day that they had cutting balloons, uh, we would use them. And this is just an example of an interesting technique uh, proposed by some doctors in Japan, respectful of the fact that uh, basically the challenge here is to get the force directed uh, properly uh, orthogonal to the baffle in order to get the needle and catheter across without having the catheter buckle or the needle slide up the baffle. And what they've done is actually uh, used a second catheter to snare their transeptal catheter in order to allow them to redirect the force effectively into the baffle and achieve transbaffle access in that manner. So I'll, I'll finish up by noting that ablation uh, is mostly about knowing where you are. Uh, it's been important for us to integrate real-time imaging tools for mapping and navigation. It's given us an enhanced ability to visualize the heart and the rhythm anatomy. And this in turn allows us to develop better hypotheses to learn how to test them. And uh, we think over time provides us with improved clinical outcomes and patient satisfaction. Ultimately, uh, when we're working with a complex arrhythmia anatomy uh, in patients uh, such as Fontan patients, uh, electroanatomical mapping systems, while they are still developing uh, in radical ways, are relatively well established. Uh, but they've given us a good handle uh, on, on the anatomy of the rhythms. We realized that we need bigger ablation lesions. We started using irrigated high power and multi electrode ablation systems. Uh, then we found that we had to refine our anatomical targeting of ablation. Uh, we figured out how to use multimodal image fusion and real-time imaging. And perhaps the next thing we will try to do is to visualize our effective lesion so we see uh, where we're actually ablating. Uh, perhaps this might be by MR lesion imaging or some other technique. So I'll stop there and thank you very much for your time.